Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're visiting with Faith Blatchford, author of Winning the Battle for the Night, God's Plan for Sleep, Dreams, and Revelation. Faith, welcome to the program. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be here. What a fabulous topic. God's plan for sleep. Imagine that statistically 60% of all Americans are taking some type of medication for anxiety or sleep. And you clearly entitle this winning the battle for the night. Yes. Because those 60% represent people that are in the battle. And Absolutely. they're turning away from God and God's word to Ambien and all of the other litany of drugs to induce sleep because they're in the battle. Yep. And is that really where God wants them? No, obviously his heart is, I mean, when you think one third of our life is going to be spent sleeping or should be spent, I mean, obviously it's not because there's so many people who are not sleeping, but God had a purpose for it. And uh, it's kind of his time. You know, there's a book, I don't know if you're familiar with the five love languages. Oh, sure. And one of the love languages is quality time. And I think God is a quality time person, and his quality time is meant to be those seven or eight hours at night when he has our full attention, and he's only got good things to give us during those hours. Now, you came up as a Bachelor of Arts in Religion from Vassar. You served as an ordained pastoral counselor at Bethel Church in Reading. You're also a regional facilitator at large of the International Bethel Sozo Network. You spend more than half the year speaking at conferences and seminars around the world, as well as meeting with leaders to provide personal counseling and creativity coaching. Uh, people can find out more about you at www.faithblatchford.com for more information. And you come to us with our great friends, at Baker Publishing Group, the Chosen Book Division. When did you, as you look back, when did this idea of winning the battle for the night, was this, is this an adult uh, driven revelation through Sozo, through healing and deliverance and the ministry of Sozo that I'm quite familiar with, or was this something that you battled, you struggled with, and you found answers through your own journey? How did you arrive at this point? It's kind of twofold. And so the first part of it started when I was eight and my dad had cancer. He was an Episcopal priest who believed in healing. I mean, it's part of the Episcopal liturgy. So we went to a healing service, and I knelt down at the altar, and the priest came, and he said, what do you want? And I said, I want my dad to be healed. So he laid his hands on me, and I didn't know what happened, but the awareness of something shifting in my life from fear, which an eight-year-old would have about her dad having cancer, right. and this presence just came over me. Well, I was hooked. You know, once you encounter God, even if you can't identify Him, I wanted more. And so that began my journey. I was converted at 15 and have been on a journey to know God in every way possible. So it wasn't until later in life, probably about oh, eight years ago, uh, I had friends who had these amazing dreams mm -hmm. and I didn't. And I was someone, I thought sleep 
was irrelevant. And I would tell people it was highly overrated and I had too much to do and just enjoyed life. And I wanted to pack as much into it as possible. So, but I, my friends had these encounters with God and I, I, w I finally admitted I'm jealous. And one of my friends laughed at me, which kind of offended me. And uh, I said, I'm serious. And I'm confessing to you, I'm jealous. And she said, Faith, you don't sleep enough to dream. And suddenly, revelation came. Like, oh, there's a connection between the fact that you dream and you sleep. And I don't dream and I don't sleep. And so that started me. I still had to be convinced that it was okay and not a waste of time to just sleep. And so that started me on a journey of discovery. And then I began to teach a message called Shifting Nightmares to Dreams, which is the result of my real research and study into is it worthwhile to sleep? And the answer? The answer was an overwhelming yes, and I had to actually repent and say, God, forgive me for uh, robbing my body and robbing you of the night. And so I wish it had happened, you know, when I was 20, burning the candle at both ends, but it's never too late to adjust, reposition, and reap the benefits of what God intended. Well, in reality, were you really prepared? Were you ready at the time? If you look back in hindsight, you weren't ready. You know, that's a hard, it's sort of a hypothetical. I know I was hungry for God, mm -hmm. and yet, and this is one of the other issues that I discovered as I was researching this book is that really the teaching in the church for centuries, starting with Thomas Aquinas, has been to set aside the whole idea that God wants to communicate with us from the outside. And so the body of Christ has been robbed of the teaching. And when you don't have the teaching, you don't have the expectation that there is actually something that God is going to do at night. The experience that you had of looking at sleep as being overrated, looking at uh, not anything tangibly beneficial about it, how, how widely or how prevalent do you think that thought, that line of thinking is in the world today? I think it's uh, very prevalent. I mean, there are apparently 70 million people who suffer in the U.S. from some kind of sleep disturbance. But on the other side of that, and there's no way to measure this, there are people like me who chose not to sleep. And one of them is uh, Ariana Huffington, who was of the Huffington Post. Mm -hmm. And she had a complete physical breakdown, uh, which resulted in a book that she wrote last year called The Sleep Revolution. So I think that there is a shift happening. The New York Times recently had a full page spread and the title was Sleep, the New Status Symbol. It is a $31 billion industry according to Silicon Valley to try and create products to meet this felt need of a sleep deficit. So I, I, we can't measure, but I think they're probably, those who have insomnia and those who are workaholics uh, or don't know, um, it's probably pretty equal. As a very highly productive person who 
I do four hours a day of live tele television. I do 250 in-person speaking engagements a year, uh, and I write a book a year on average. Uh, I get plenty of sleep. I actually have more free time than most of the people I know, and they say that I'm the busiest person that they've ever known. Mm -hmm. uh, because we serve a God who, if you are doing his work, he redeems the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, people forget that God is sovereign. So if God tells us, uh, and he tells us in a very specific term, he says, he that watches over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. Right. While we're asleep, he is at work. Yes. He actually tells us in Second Samuel chapter 14, verse 14, he actually tells us what he's up to. And he says, like water falls to the ground and does not return, we all must die. But God does not desire that. He devises ways for those who are estranged from him to return. I wonder when he's doing that in our lives. Mm -hmm. While we're asleep so that he can now get us out of the way. Yes. Do you think that we've looked at sleep? We know bodily function. We know this, uh, to me, a, an incredibly exciting concept was when I came to the realization that in 2 Corinthians 5.17, where Paul makes the statement that anyone who's a Messiah is a new creation, the old is gone, the new has come, most of that call that their born-again experience. And I had uh, this this realization that, my goodness, I woke up this morning as a new creation. Mm -hmm. The hairs on my head are changed. The cells in my body are changed. Some of my cells have died. Some of my cells have been birthed. I have new skin. I have new hair. Certain hair has fallen out. New hair has grown. I'm actually not the same person I was right. when I went to bed. God has made me new. Therefore, I am a new creation every day. Physically, spiritually, emotionally. And he does that while I sleep. He yes. renews me. He yes. refreshes me. He cleanses me internally. That is when my bodily functions, my kidneys are working, my liver is working, my pancreas is working, my internal organs, while I'm shut down consciously, our organs are at the work purifying, and God put us in that prone position because of the way the blood flows and how the heart moves and how the extremities, and so scientifically, perfectly, natural yes. that God gave us this position of incline uh, and recline in order to put ourselves in a position mm -hmm. to sleep. It seems quite important. And it seems like the battle of the night that there happens to be someone who is as well aware of the positive plan God has for you and the positive revelation and the positive message and the positive dream, there is a counterfeit out there who is the author of Night Terrors and who has implanted a deep fear of sleep mm -hmm. and those who are afraid of the dark because yes. of what lurks in that time when they are at a time of complete surrender. Mm -hmm. Is this all interconnected in this battle for the night? 
Yes, and I think, you know, the enemy doesn't play fair, and he capitalizes on one lie. And what I found in researching this was I was, I kept hearing the phrase, the prince of darkness, and I thought, I wonder where that is in the Bible. And I looked, I asked people, I did all kinds of research, I could not find one reference to Prince of Darkness. So I thought, well, where did that come from? Well, it came from a cleric back in the, I don't know, 12th or 13th century who put it in a sermon. Then John Milton used it in Paradise Lost. And then it was taken by pop culture, Dracula, Prince of Darkness, and then we have Ozzy Osbourne, and we have this whole culture of darkness where the enemy has uh, taken unto himself an authority that is not his. And so this is the lie that we win the battle in part by renouncing the lie that the, that Satan is the owner of the darkness. He's not. God created it. God dwells in it. God named it. And when you name something, you have authority over it. So that one lie, I have seen people whose entire sleep history change the moment they renounce the lie that Satan owns the darkness and said, God, you own the night. And it, everything changed. You know, Faith, while you were talking, God gave me this, this flash of how so many believers grab a hold of first thing in the morning, Ephesians 6, and put on the full armor of God. Mm-hmm. However, you don't wear the same clothes to bed at night that you put on in the morning. Mm-hmm. And are we actually, physically, spiritually, taking off the armor of God and putting on our comfort clothes Mm -hmm. when in reality I'm much more in my awake state to do spiritual battle than I am in my sleep state? Maybe I should be putting on the armor of God to go to bed. Well, (laughs) I I don't think so. (laughs) Because the whole idea from the scripture, and I know we don't have time to go through them all, is God hides us in his secret place, which is the darkness. He dwells in the darkness. That he is the one that watches over us even as we sleep and that sleep is to be sweet peaceful that i curl up in the presence of god and i don't have to wear my armor to bed and too many people go to bed with their armor on thinking they're going to bed in enemy territory Interesting. And you, you don't sleep. If you're in the service, you're a military guy, gal, you're behind enemy lines, you don't sleep very peacefully right. because you are trespassing in enemy territory. And we have that idea that at night we're trespassing and we're not safe. And that's a lie. This life we live of kind of uh, eight hours of sleep, eight hours of work, eight hours of fellowship, family, however we decide to split the day up, Mm -hmm. God has used this. If we look at God's order and we hold on to the passage that says that every good gift comes from God, then sleep must have been a good gift. Mm -hmm. How have we gotten so turned around? 
what was it that got you convinced that sleep was a waste of time? Sleep was valueless because that was in in our opening discussion. That was uh, uh, something that you spoke to that that it really was. Um, you had no time to waste sleeping. There was life to live and things to do. Well, I think it goes back to this whole idea of teaching. And I, I have never heard a message in the church on sleep and the purpose of sleep and God's interaction with us and what it does for our body. I think it should be one of the basic discipling messages that we are disseminating to new believers because if you don't have it taught and then you don't have it modeled either by your parents or by your you know church family you know you're not gonna just on your own decide yeah I think I'm gonna sleep eight hours while everybody else is out having a good time you know right. I have a friend who lives in New York New York is the city that never sleeps. And so one of the other reasons, <clears throat> excuse me, is modern society, technology. I mean, in the garden, there were no lights. There's no electricity. So, you know, you can't garden in the dark. So you go to bed. It was imposed in forced sleep. But then we get light and we get all the modern conveniences and so I mean day or night becomes day because I've got light 24 hours a day I've got social media I've got movie theaters that are open grocery stores I have friends who go to Walmart at 3 in the morning because there are fewer people so our society is promoting this idea that just you know live 24-7 and get as much done and have as much fun as you want. We are people who go to church get a an injection as if it were an inoculation for the weak uh, of providing us with whatever spiritual nourishment we need. Mm -hmm. uh, not sleeping is literally closing a door in the face of God. Mm -hmm. It is saying I'm not inviting you in. I'll invite you to the dinner table when I say grace. I'll invite you into my problem when I have a need. I will yes. invite you into my circumstance. But when I surrender, I surrender as an... It's almost... I surrender because I have the control to mm -hmm. surrender. But if I relinquish the control to surrender, I can sleep. If I just go ahead and let go, I can then enter into a place where I have to be able to come and re reconcile. Do I really trust God? When I can't look out for myself, do I really believe that he watches over me? Mm -hmm. The stories we tell our children to put them to bed, to convince them that God is watching over them. Are we spinning a tale? Are we offering words of comfort that we do not apply to ourselves? Are we, have we become that hypocritical? Mm-hmm that we are espousing this message to lull our children to sleep while we fight the battle because we have a better way. Mm -hmm. It's not a part of God's design. We're talking with Faith Blatchford. 
author of Winning the Battle for the Night, God's Plan for Sleep, Dreams, and Revelation. Sleep deprivation, sleep issues, night terrors, uh, busyness, robbing God of opportunities to meet us in a place. Uh, quite honestly, I know most of you would say you talk to God all the time. That's your prayer life. You have an ongoing conversation with God. But what if God wants to have an ongoing conversation with you mm -hmm. and you're not there? What if he set aside on his calendar time to meet with you, but you made yourself unavailable? Is this what we're doing in this battle for the night? Mm -hmm. Are we depriving God access? We beg for his presence. We yearn for the manifestation of the angel dust, of the gold dust, of the miraculous growing out of an arm. But what if in the still, quiet time of the night is really God's appointment time with us? Yes. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to dig into some of the concepts that faith has been able to identify uh, tools and understanding so that we can win the battle for the night. We'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program, Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Igniting a Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.inbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www. Dot ianbn .com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, 
the heart lines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5th, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heart lines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we are visiting with Faith Blatchford, author of Winning the Battle for the Night, God's Plan for Sleep, Dreams, and Revelation. You know, while we're on break, Faith and I were talking and uh, we were sharing some uh, experiences. And I said, you know, in my lifetime, I've not been one who has been, uh, would fall in the category of a dreamer. I, I have people come to me daily in the office here and say, uh, Rabbi, I had a dream. Can you tell me what this might mean? And they'll talk to me about their dreams. And uh, they're in technicolor and they have uh, shifting landscapes and they're exotic and they're vivid and they remember times, places, events, people. And uh, my response is, sure, I'll listen, but I'm going to be relating from, of course, a biblical perspective. But I personally am not a person who has a recollection of any real vivid dreams. I'm 65 years old, and I can't really tell you uh, I've not had any recurring dreams or recurring nightmares or dreams that were revelatory that I could wake up the next day and say, oh, I had this dream and let me tell you all about it. Mm -hmm. But you said something in the break that is nothing short of brilliant. Mm. And I want you to share that with the audience. Yeah, I find this... Uh in talking to people that people say oh I don't dream and they're disappointed and they almost uh, devalue themselves and they think well I, God must not really have much in store for me because other people dream and I don't and so I'm less than and so it is another way the enemy causes them to disconnect from opportunity with God but what I have found, because I'm not a big dreamer either, even after all my study and research and desire, but I learned something. And that is that God doesn't necessarily give you a dream that you remember. He gives you revelation. He gives you and he gives me downloads of revelation, so much so that ever since I started studying and learned this, I always record myself when I speak because invariably I'm in the middle of speaking at some conference and I will say something that I have never thought of, never heard, never read, and I kind of step back and say, wow, because I am so impacted by what I just said. And now I know that's something that God downloaded to me when I was sleeping at some point. And actually, when you think about Solomon and his amazing encounter with God in a dream, God told him, I'm going to give you 
incredible wealth, but I'm going to give you wisdom more than anyone on the face of the earth. Well, that to me is what a lot of people experience. They get ideas, they get inventions, they get uh, revelation, wisdom while they sleep. The issue, the thing is, they never give God the credit for it because they never were set up to have an expectation that he was going to give them those things. And God doesn't say, hey, wait a minute, that was my idea. He doesn't need the credit, but I think the more we understand, oh my gosh, he has the mysteries of the universe to download to me if I will just position myself to receive. You know, it's so interesting that you say that. If we reframe our understanding of it was my idea, it was my thought, and say, and even make the effort to look back and say, what was the genesis of that idea? Well, you know, I woke up one day and I began thinking. Well, why did you begin thinking that day when you woke up? Because the seed was planted while you were asleep. And if we reframed our position on, on how much we think of our own intellect and our own capacity for creativity and really did honor God, who is the author and the finisher, who does know every one of our thoughts, if we reframed it, we would then put him back in the position of creator. Mm -hmm. That the work of creation, technically, hebraically, was completed in seven days. Six days mm -hmm. of work, one day of rest. But the creative power of God never ceases. Therefore, mm -hmm. we serve the creator, the creator of the here, the creator of the now, the creator of the past, the present, and the future. And I wonder how our faith would be girded up if we began to acknowledge more of God and less of ourselves and the ownership of these ideas. Would God yes. then honor by saying, now that they were one of the ten lepers who came back to thank me, I can trust them with more. They were faithful to give me the glory. Mm -hmm. Would that open up the door to an even greater, deeper, more provocative relationship with God if we did give him the credit? If mm -hmm. we did win the battle for the night by starting out by accepting the assignment, which is, Lord, I put myself in a position to receive. We do that at the altar. We do mm -hmm. that in church. We do that in our waking moments. But it seems we resist that posture at the time in which we should be applying it the most. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't fault people, you know, in general. And it does go back to this whole issue of we have not been taught. Yes. And we have been robbed through lack of teaching. We've been robbed through the deception of the enemy. And so people have they have no clue about the possibility. And so I don't fault people. I'm just on a mission to inform and to challenge people, to, you know, hold out this incredible opportunity to interact with the creator of the universe who is happens to be our father and who wants to share with us and have us collaborate with him because creativity is always collaborative. It was in Genesis 
and it continues to be. But we need to position ourselves to be able to collaborate with him. Do you think that because we've become such carnal people that we have assigned the bedroom as a place of intimacy and put it in the physical realm when actually it was designed as a place of intimacy for both the physical and the spiritual realm and that the intimacy that God desires happens to be in the place of intimacy where we fully understand physical intimacy mm -hmm. that occurs in the bedroom. But spiritual in intimacy can occur in that same bedroom in our sleep time where God has access to be intimate with us by reaching us. We're still, we're quiet, we're able to receive. Mm -hmm. Is is this something that, that, that resonates with you? Oh, absolutely. And I think there are many reasons that we are not intimate with God. Uh, a lot of people deal with shame and guilt that hinders them from feeling that they can approach God and they don't want intimacy because they feel like they're dirty or something. So this whole issue of forgiveness and lack of forgiveness, I think is key in many ways. One is forgiving ourselves so that we can enter into God's presence, receiving the forgiveness. The other side of that coin is forgiving other people. And I think Paul's word to the Ephesians, he said, don't go to bed angry because you give a foothold to the enemy. And I think that when we hold on to anger, that becomes unforgiveness. It becomes resentment, bitterness, judgment. And we send up a huge spotlight into the night sky that is, instead of calling all angels, we're calling all demons. And the word nightmare actually means night demon. And so when people wake up and they say, oh, I had a, de a nightmare straight from hell, it was. But I think we control to a great degree what we interact with at night. And one of the major ways is lack of forgiveness. And for me, I mean, it's a no brainer. Do I want to forgive somebody who offended me? I don't care what it was. Or do I want to hold on to the offense and just subject myself to the tormentors at night? And, I mean, hands down, I'm going to forgive. But I think the forgiveness message has not been emphasized enough so that people understand it's critical to live in forgiveness. You talk about that in the book. Yes. You actually make it a uh, very important part of uh, calling it the weapon of forgiveness. Yes. That there is so much power in this weapon of forgiveness that it sets the captive free. Mm -hmm. We're held captive to unforgiveness. We're held captive to bitterness. We're held captive to thoughts. And we are told to hold every thought captive to the mind of Messiah. But Messiah's message was a message of forgiveness. Yes. And uh, I think we're confused by what forgiveness means. It does not mean condoning. It means exactly. releasing. Mm -hmm. It means letting go uh, so that we can receive forgiveness. Mm -hmm. 
the time, and, and I'm looking at, at, at <coughs> the setting, <coughs> excuse me, in your book, do you talk about preparation, preparing yourself for sleep? And, yes. and what some of the vital, important steps are that you feel uh, you outline in the book uh, people need to be cognizant of in order to put themselves in a position to receive? I think it's on three levels because we are a triune being just like God is. So. There are the physical preparation, the mental, and then there's the spiritual aspect of it. And I think on the physical level, I mean, it's simple things like don't drink caffeine before you go to bed or after a certain hour in the day. Don't eat carbohydrate, sugar, that you know it keeps your children awake. Well, it's going to keep you awake. All right physical aspects of the temperature in your room. It actually needs to be a cool temperature, 68. Those are some of the physical. The mental things have to do with things like social media because the blue light and the screen on your phone, your iPad, actually affects the rhythm of your body and wakes you up. So there is actually on an iPhone a setting called night shift that will at a certain time it will change the light on your screen. But even more importantly, it's put the phone away, put the iPad away, take it out of your room because so many times we get stirred up by something we see on Facebook. Somebody had a party and we weren't invited. So it gets us to thinking and it gets us into a place of offense. And that takes us to the third, the spiritual dynamic, which is the forgiveness element. Another aspect of that is the whole issue of pornography, which yes. is not a popular topic. But when we put it in, in this realm of giving God access to us, the enemy has used pornography both as a form of comfort for people rather than God's comfort, right. but also using pornography, it captures the screen of our brain. There's only one screen. So the place that you view pornography is the same screen that God wants to download visions and dreams. And once again, it's this choice. You know, do I want to be tormented by demons or do I want to forgive? Do I want to watch pornography and have my nightlife captured by those images? Or do I want God's downloads? of visions and dreams. So those are some of the spiritual, physical, mental repositioning that we have control over. So we have habits we have to break the same way we have habits that we've, we've garnered in the world that we do that we know <clears throat> are not beneficial but they're habitual <clears throat> and we find a certain amount of uh, comfort in our discomfort, a uh, mm -hmm. certain amount of restlessness uh, or restfulness in our restlessness. And <clears throat> you uh, give in uh, uh, your last chapter dream questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you take us on a journey, what can I do if I don't remember my dreams? And you answer some very, very straightforward questions. Uh, I've asked God the meaning of my dream, but I have not heard anything. What should I do? Uh, I'm still puzzled by a recurring nightmare I had as a child. What should I do? You offer very practical answers to questions that I think a lot of people have, a lot of people struggle with. When it comes to uh, self-inflicted 
obstacles to sleep. And this reaching for the sleeping pill because it's a habit. And I have make myself think I didn't take it, so now I'm not going to be able to sleep. How do we break that cycle? First of all, you know, I know there are millions of people who have sleep medication prescriptions. And number one, there is no condemnation. Absolutely no condemnation. I think it is the burden is on the church that we have not taught people about sleep and about God's gift of sleep. And we've not taught people how to deal with their anxiety and their pain. So I don't fault people. But I think that there has to be uh, a willingness to connect with God and begin the journey of discovery that actually God can deal with the issues that I'm worried about that keep me awake because a lot of people suffer insomnia they also suffer from depression and anxiety there's a link so let's find the answer from God for the things that I'm anxious about and that will affect our sleep I don't want to condemn people because the only thing they could find was ambient. I'm here to say, hey, you know, you found ambient. Let me show you another prescription. And it actually is something that God provides. And so we are the ambassadors of sleep, so to speak, from God to help people put down whatever they're using to find rest and to introduce them to the God of sleep. And this is something I've been, I have these cards, it'll be backwards, but that I carry with me and I have been amazed because everywhere I go, this is even TSA agents, this is the latest one, Newark Airport, they were questioning me and they said, what are you doing? And I told, and I said, I'm an author and I have a new book that's come out. And they said, what is it? And so I pulled out the card and I had a, quite a lengthy discussion with two TSA agents. One wanted me to autograph the card because this issue of sleep knows no boundaries. It's every race, every economic level, education. So this is a wonderful opportunity to connect people with the God of sleep because of this felt need on the part of millions of people. You know, as you and I are talking and people uh, are watching the program, the question comes up, if no one is out there talking about this and you've risen to the role of being the spokesperson what do you think about appearing on this program on a regular basis, a monthly basis, of uh, giving a teaching and having a conversation related to some of the common issues that you're hearing from people that need ministering in the area of sleep? Uh, I would open up the email lines at, at info at ignitinganation.com, put in the subject line questions about sleep, and have you post, we post, uh, that we would open ourselves up to answering some of the questions, some of the struggles. Many of them are answered in here, but to answer all of them would take an encyclopedia. Right. But if we have identified, you and I, in just this hour, that the pulpit is not addressing sleep. Right. Doctors are addressing it through pharmacology and they're making a fortune at it. If sleep is so important to God that one third of our life is assigned to it, what can we do about it and how will that change us as believers? I think it's too important a topic not to talk about on a regular basis. So I want you to consider that as an offer. 
and Thank think you. about whether or not you'd be willing to join us as one of our regular contributors right here on this program. We have several others. We have them from the, uh, the headline. We have them from the heart line, and we have them from the mm -hmm. biblical truth part uh, of experts to come on with us. And I think this is an important issue, and people are even l afraid to talk about it among themselves. Right. It's, it's a, they feel embarrassed or ashamed. Well, we have run out of time at Faith. I want you to consider that offer and okay. uh, talk with Grace and see what we might be able to set up. We've been talking with Faith, with Faith Blatchard, author of Winning the Battle for the Night, God's Plan for Sleep, Dreams, and Revelation, a subject we don't talk to about enough, but one that's tackled in this very, very unique book that is blowing wide open this topic of these eight hours that God has set aside for himself that we have muddied up as much as we possibly can. Faith, thank you so much for being with us here on Revealing the Truth. Thank you for writing this book. We wish you much success, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you, Eric. It's a God pleasure. You. Thank you. God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we will bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.